wants to be a part of the Fast and Furious family? Who's ready to see this ride? Three, two, one. Ugh, I don't want to do this. I don't want to talk about it. You know what? Get over it, Jack. Face your fears and conquer your demons. Hello and welcome to Theme Park History, the channel for everything to do with theme parks. Old and new, big and small. In today's episode, I punish myself for no good reason as we explore... Ugh. Fast and Furious Supercharged. And wait, what type of attraction is it? You know what? It doesn't even matter at this point. It's an attraction that opened at Universal Studios Hollywood on June 25th, 2015, and Universal Studios Florida on April 23rd, 2018. This attraction was suggested by all these people who are gluttons for punishment. So thank you for the comment. No, you know what? I take that back. No thank you. Bad viewers. Based on the Fast and Furious film franchise, Franchise. Supercharged claims to be a groundbreaking mega attraction conceived as a new installment to the series. Featuring the acting chops of renowned actors like Vin Diesel, Michelle Rodriguez, and Dwayne The Rock Johnson, the ride catapults guests into the high-stakes underground world of fast cars in a harrowing escapade to save one of their own from an international crime cartel. Considered by theme park goers as one of the worst theme park rides of all time, Supercharged is not only considered the worst attraction Universal has created, but one of the biggest missteps in theme park history. So I'm just gonna wing the intro for this part because honestly I don't know where to begin when it comes to talking about the attraction. I've dreaded this day ever since I created the channel, knowing I would have to eventually talk about the ride in a serious manner instead of just making jokes about it. You know, I've put it off as long as I could, but I think it's finally time to talk about how this terrible, god-awful nightmare finally became a reality. So let's see, uh, let's head back to the year 2006. Disneyland was still celebrating the happy his homecoming on Earth, Monsters Incorporated, Mike and Sully to the Rescue opened at Disney's California Adventure in January, Expedition Everest opened at Disney's Animal Kingdom in April, and by September, Universal Studios Florida was getting ready to close one of its most iconic attractions. Yay! On September 7th, 2006, Universal announced time had run out for Back to the Future The Ride, as the 16-year-old simulator attraction would close to make room Room for an as yet undisclosed new attraction. The 21 million gigawatt adventure spanning 1 million years had already closed down one of the domes in order to properly, quote, explore possibilities for future rides. What were two of those possibilities Universal was exploring, you ask? The 20th Century Fox, now Disney-owned animated sitcom The Simpsons, and their very own The Fast and the Furious film franchise. If you're not familiar with The Fast Fast and the Furious. The film was released in 2001 and follows Brian O'Connor, played by Paul Walker, an undercover cop tasked with discovering the identities of a group of unknown automobile hijackers led by Dominic Toretto, played by Vin Diesel. The movie, which had people attempting to hijack a truckload of DVD players and stereos, yes, this is how dated the film is, was a box office success, grossing over $200 million worldwide and leading to a two 2003 sequel, Too Fast, Too Furious, which was also a hit, grossing over $230 million. Because of the success of the two films, Universal had supposedly leaned strongly toward replacing time traveling with illegal street racing. That was until the third film in the franchise was released during the summer of 2006. Titled The Fast and the Furious, Tokyo Drift, the film had none of the series' initial cast members return. Instead, focusing on high school car enthusiast Sean Boswell, who is sent to live in Tokyo with his father, hang out with Bow Wow, and find solace in the city's drifting community. Needless to say, the changes of location and lack of star power didn't really do the movie any favors, as it only made $158 million worldwide, making it the lowest grossing film in the franchise. Because of the disappointing returns from Tokyo Drift and the uncertainty of either Diesel or Walker returning for 
any future films, Universal decided to go with the more well-established and much-praised Simpsons instead. Even though it didn't become the next major attraction in Florida, Fast and Furious would still win a consolation prize for participating, becoming part of the Hollywood Studio Tour. So what did Universal come up with for the franchise that has everything to do with fast cars and heists? Ah, oh, Jesus, tap dancing, Christ, that was awful. Why is anything with Fast and Furious at a theme park just so bad? How hard can it be? The Fast and the Furious Extreme Close-Up officially opened as part of the studio tour on June 15, 2006. Inspired by the Tokyo Drift film, which was released just a day later, the attraction was Universal's attempt to place guests into the in-your-face close-up range of the pulse-pounding, rubber-burning underground world of Drift Street Racing. How would they pull that off, you ask? By having two stripped-down drift racing cars, each attached to a giant gigantic robotic arm, careening alarmly out of control with a finale that featured an automotive dance demonstration of intricate programming set to a toe-tapping hip-hop beat. Yeah, that makes complete sense. Whenever I think of Fast and Furious, the first thing that comes to mind are cars attached to robotic arms. What a dummy! Actually, I take that back. The robotic arms used were made by KUKA, who helped create the RoboCoaster G2 ride system featured in Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey, so I guess this attraction was was worth it after all? Anyway, while the new addition to the studio tour was appreciated, the general consensus for Extreme Close-Up was disappointing, as guests wanted something more than just a two-minute demonstration. Maybe something a bit more Fast and Furious? Speaking of Fast and Furious, that would be the title of the fourth film released in 2009, a direct sequel to The Fast and the Furious. It was the first film in the series since the original to feature the main cast which helped rejuvenate the franchise. Earning over $363 million worldwide to quickly become the highest grossing film in the series. You probably can figure out how the rest of the story goes. Fast and Furious led to a sequel, which led to another sequel, which led to another sequel, and so on and so forth. Each film making more money than the previous one. The Fast Saga is Universal Pictures' highest grossing film series of all time, with a combined earnings of close to $6 billion. With the closure of Extreme Close-Up, in 2013 and the urge to capitalize on the popularity of their billion-dollar franchise. Universal announced on April 8, 2014 that as part of the studio tour's 50th anniversary, Fast and Furious Supercharged, a hybrid movie and thrill ride, would be the tour's all-new grand finale. Construction on the attraction would begin later that summer, replacing the curse of the mummy's tomb. Taking place within a newly constructed 65,000 square foot building. The ride has the tram drive onto a hydraulic motion-based platform, which is able to tilt the tram left and right, raise it up and down, and vibrate. The attraction features the world's longest 3D projection installation ever created, wrapping the length of the building with one continuous screen. The custom-built compound curve screen spans nearly 400 feet in length, 40 feet in height, and features 34 4K projectors that use a never-before-seen front projection system to display the ride film. The ride film went into production mid-2014, taking place on a soundstage in Playa Vista, California. The main cast from the films returned for the shoot, including Diesel as Dominic Toretto, Michelle Rodriguez as Letty Ortiz, Tyrese Gibson as Roman Pierce, Dwayne The Rock Johnson as Luke Hobbs, and Luke Evans as Owen Shaw. The cast filmed their scenes using green screens, which was then composited into a select collection of scenic images shot in Los Angeles to deliver hyper-realistic imagery and interactions with real environments as opposed to fabricated CGI images. <laughs> Oh, how ironic is that last line. The attraction also features the use of the Mucian Eyeliner Projection System, which is used to create a hologram of the actors, making them look like they are there in person with the guests. With a price tag of too much, we're not enough, depending on who you ask. 
Fast and Furious Supercharged officially opened as the grand finale of the studio tour on June 25th, 2015. In attendance for the red carpet premiere were Diesel, Rodriguez, and Gibson, which ended with Dom's Dodge Charger evading the police and crashing through a billboard for the attraction. Located within the studio tour at Universal Studios Hollywood, the story of the ride is actually intertwined throughout the back lot. After passing by Wisteria Lane, the studio tour guide spots a black 1970 Dodge Charger that shouldn't be part of the tour. The guide reaches out to backlot security, who will send someone to investigate. Shortly after passing the vehicle, FBI agent Novak interrupts the tour, informing the guide and guests the Charger belongs to a Dominic Toretto, a criminal on the run that he's been tracking for a while. Novak tells everyone if they see Dom to just keep a safe distance and report any further sightings to students security. Later during the tour, Novak once again interrupts, but before he can say anything meaningful, he's cut off by Special Agent Luke Hobbs, who tells Novak that this is now his operation, as there's a high-value witness from the Federal Protection Program aboard the tram, and an international crime syndicate led by Owen Shaw is homing in on it to take out the witness and anybody else on board. Hobbs wants to move the tram to a safe location until he has the situation under control. The tram eventually makes its way to Sullivan's Garage, a well-known street racer party hangout for safety. Inside the garage, Roman Pierce and Letty Ortiz introduce themselves, who want to help Hobbs with hiding the guests from Shaw, asking them to put away their cameras and turn off their cell phones, as one flash or ringtone could give away their location. Really, a flash from a camera inside a building is going to give away their location. How does that make any sense? The tram pulls further into the garage to where a massive social gathering is taking place, but is quickly broken up by Agent Novak and other FBI agents. Novak makes an attempt to arrest Roman, but is stopped by Dom, Lenny, and Hobbs, who's just nonchalantly carrying around a machine gun. As Dom is telling the guests that the whole family, whatever that means, will protect them, Roman gets a call on his cell phone, giving away the tram's location. Dom tells the driver to move the tram to the parking garage, as he, Lenny, and Roman get into their own vehicles, ready for an all-out assault from Shaw. Now in a parking garage, Shaw finally arrives, threatening guests with a flamethrower to reveal who the witness is. Before anyone snitches, Dom and his charger rams into Shaw's truck, allowing the tram to escape from the garage and into the streets of Los Angeles. Not going fast enough because it's full of people, Roman and Letty hook the tram to their turbo trucks, hit the nitrous, and head for the freeway. Shaw reappears, trying to cut a deal with Dom for the witness, but gets brake checked instead. Letty somehow gets out of her truck and into an excavator with a claw, clamping down on Shaw's truck and throwing it into a wall, most likely killing him. I mean, it had to, right? That was straight up murder. After Shaw's grim demise, three attack helicopters arrive, looking to take out the tram using missiles. Dom does his best Iron Giant impersonation to save the guests, jumping out of his charger and grabbing onto one of the helicopter's landing skids. Let me repeat that. He somehow jumps out of a moving vehicle and grabs onto a flying helicopter. I can't make this shit up if I tried. Because of Dom's distraction, Hobbs is able to use his machine gun to take out the helicopters. As Dom miraculously makes it safely back to his charger, the tram and other vehicles find themselves in an oil refinery, where two of the helicopters crash, causing a massive explosion chain reaction. Making one last ditch effort to escape a fiery ending, every vehicle hits the nitrous, jumping over a bridge that's still under construction while Dom tells guests, how poetic. The vehicles make the jump and head into a warehouse, successfully escaping from Shaw and his syndicate. Dom, Letty, Roman, and Hobbs thanks guests for helping protect the witness and offer them to join their crew anytime. The tram heads back to the plaza, which signals the end of the studio tour, letting guests back into the park. The roughly three-minute attraction has been met with mixed reviews from guests, as some have praised it as a must-ride for fans of the franchise.
franchise and a much needed addition to the studio tour as the last major staged event to open as part of the tour was King Kong 360 3D in 2010. While others have criticized the ride's video game-like graphics instead of the promised hyper-realistic imagery, subpar acting, and for being the same exact type of experience like Kong is. If there was one thing certain about the polarizing attraction, it was Universal still had plans for what they perceived was a high-octane, adrenaline-fueled thrill ride. Only two months after the somewhat successful opening in Universal Studios Hollywood, it was announced on August 25, 2015, that Fast and Furious Supercharged would be coming to Universal Studios Florida. No official details were given on how different the Florida version would be, but rumors at the time suggested it would be similar to Hollywood but feature more screens and a different ride vehicle, as the Florida version would be its own standalone attraction. Construction on the attraction would begin in early 2016. 16, replacing two attractions, Disaster, a motion picture starring you, and Beetlejuice's Graveyard Review, officially opening on April 23, 2018. While similar to Hollywood, the Florida version has some differences. Now featuring a themed queue, two pre-shows introducing two new characters reprising their roles from the franchise, Tej Parker played by Ludacris, and Mia Toretto played by Jordana Brewster, and a slightly tweaked story. Located in the San Francisco section of the park, Park. Guests enter a garage with Dom's charger parked outside. As they make their way through the queue, guests pass by numerous vehicles featured from the films and enter the first pre-show. Mia Toretto calls in, informing guests that her brother Dom has won another street race along with another car for his collection. Dom and the rest of the family are celebrating at Sullivan's garage, with Mia inviting everyone to the party. In Tej's war room, he explains the guest's vehicle, a party bus, is ready to roll out. Out, but is interrupted by a call from Dom, who tells him the FBI is about to raid the garage. To make matters worse, Owen Shaw is following them. Hobbs calls Tej to inform him of the worsening situation, suggesting getting everyone out of the garage by putting them on the party bus and using the party as a diversion. To prevent Shaw from tracking their location, Hobbs tells everyone to turn off their cell phone. Guests exit from the war room and head to the loading dock, where they board the 48-passenger party bus. As the rest of the attraction plays out exactly the same as it does in Hollywood. Reception to the attraction was met with immediate overwhelmingly negative reviews from both guests and critics, as the most common criticism was nothing new added to the actual ride portion, leaving riders feeling underwhelmed by the experience that can be described as being neither fast or furious. Now while there are plenty of things that make it the worst ride at the park, Instead of just listing them off, I thought we could take a closer look at why this attraction sucks so much ass. Ladies and gentlemen, here's five reasons why Supercharged is the worst attraction ever created by Universal. Number one, the facade. They say that first impressions are everything, and it's no exception when it comes to theme parks. Think about your favorite theme park attraction, doesn't matter what park it is. Before you actually go on the ride, the first thing you encounter is the entrance or facade of that attraction. Some of the most iconic and popular attractions have something that make it stand out. For Disney, it's attractions like the Matterhorn, Space Mountain, the Haunted Mansion, Spaceship Earth, and the Twilight Zone Tower of Terror to name a few. For Universal, it's Jaws, Jurassic Park, the Incredible Hulk, Dueling Dragons, and of course, the Harry Potter attractions. Before you even enter an attraction, the entrance catches your eye in some way and sets the tone for what's to come. Supercharge's entrance is nothing more than a garage with the logo painted on. Oh, how riveting. Outside of that logo, there's not much betraying that's a Fast and Furious ride. The building is such a major eyesore, why not have some party music and colored lights? Maybe a few cars parked outside to draw guests' curiosity? Let's be honest here. If you happen to be walking around your neighborhood and saw a building exactly like this, would you enter it to see what's inside? Odds are not likely. Number 2. The Queue Most common theme park goers probably don't realize it, but the queue plays an important part in the complete experience of an attraction. When it comes to Universal's attractions, each queue helps establish the tone, lay out the backstory, and build up the anticipation before actually experiencing the 
ride. The Amazing Adventures of Spider-Man takes you through the Daily Bugle while news reports explain the Sinister Syndicate is attacking New York City. Harry Potter and the Forbidden Journey has you touring Hogwarts Castle, checking out classrooms and encountering characters like Harry, Ron, and Hermione. And Men in Black Alien Attack pulls a fast one on you, made to look like a World's Fair exhibit only to reveal itself to be a cover for an actual MIB headquarters. Each queue has been highly thought out, full of details and props to make waiting in line a little bit more entertaining. Yeah, Supercharge's queue lacks any of this whatsoever. Now, while it does feature 15 vehicles, some from the films while others were created just for the attraction, and even a few tributes to previous attractions, Beetlejuice, Disaster, and even Back to the Future, the rest of the queue is pretty bland, full of equipment and props that just don't stand out. Now, this was supposedly done on purpose, as the ride features the virtual line system, which allows guests to reserve a time to return to the attraction and go on the ride without any long wait times required. There's one problem. Since there's virtually never an actual wait time for the attraction, the system is never needed. You can just skip the cars and head straight to the pre-shows if you want it. You know what they should have done? Take a page out of Disney's playbook and make the queue interactive. Have some of the cars feature interactive elements. One could have a musical car horn that plays different tunes. Another could have its lights change color. One could have hydraulics that bounce up and down. All which could have been controlled by buttons where the app created for the park. And if you're going to say that a garage queue can't be cool, I think the original test track queue begs to differ. Number three, the pre-shows. So you made it past the queue and think it's finally time to experience the attraction, right? Hate to break it to you, but your suffering isn't over just yet. Nah, not by a long shot. While pre-shows are nothing new to attractions and are supposed to explain what guests are about to get themselves into, the pre-shows for this ride struggle to get that point across due to the live actors involved. Now let me make this point clear. This is in no way a shot at anyone who has worked or is working the attraction right now. This is just a common observation. Why is the actor or actress in the war room written to be so awkward? I know they explain it's the person's first day working by themselves, but why are they so nervous and cringy? For a franchise known for their characters to be a bunch of badass daredevils full of bravado, this person just doesn't make any sense. Now I know they were written to be the comedic relief, but the jokes don't hit and the person's demeanor throughout makes them come off as pathetic. Like, why would Tej even hire this person to help run his operation? Now, I will admit I'm probably overthinking this one, but when the only thing that sticks in your head from the pre-show is how the employee talking to the screens probably hates it just as much as you do, I think that's a problem. Number four, the ride. I mean, where do I even begin? Plain and simple, the ride is one of the most terrible experiences I've ever had at a theme park. Instead of being on a tram, you're now on a quote, party bus, complete with its own mannequin head glued on to look like the driver. Real nice choice with that one, Universal. So immersive. I mean, the entire bus, with its loud music blasting, lights flashing, a lack of windows and seat belts, just makes it so cheap and tacky. This isn't a party bus, it's more like a school bus, if you ask me. Hell, I've gone on field trips as a kid that were more entertaining than this ride. The acting is awful. It's like everyone got paid before they actually started filming and nobody gave a shit once the director said action. I mean, look at this scene. In particular, the acting of Special Agent Novak. Roll the clip. This is what we do. This is the race day after party. And where, where the other girl? Roman Pierce. Roman Pierce, FBI, on the ground. Me On the ground, do it now. You know how long I took to iron this shirt, man? I'm not On the ground, right now. Really, that's the best you can do. How many takes did they give this guy? Just the one? I mean, you're an FBI agent and you finally tracked down someone that's been on the run for a while now, and this is how you approach them? Why that slight delay between Novak and Roman's interactions? I know Tyrese Gibson isn't the best actor, but I would show a little bit more concern about being arrested. Hell, were they even together to shoot the scene? Or, you know, I don't know, did they film each separately and then just edit them together? I don't know what it is about that interaction, but it just pisses me off so much. I mean, Bill Paxton and Helen Hunt had more chemistry in the pre-shows for Twister Ride It Out, and they despised each other so much they refused to shoot the pre-show together. So Universal had to film both of those scenes separately, and it still worked out better than Novak and Gibson. Also, whenever Vin Diesel speaks, it's like he just woke up and is still groggy and half asleep. This is all the proof you need for why the films aren't praised for its writing and acting. I mean, I like the films, but it's not going to win an Academy Award 
award anytime soon. The actual ride part is a complete clutter of small pieces of crap rolled together to make a massive dingleberry. The graphics somehow look worse than the upcoming Fast and Furious video game. The action is all over the place and hard to follow. Trust me on that one, I would know. Take a wild guess at how many times I had to watch a video to figure out what the plot was. It was six times. You know your ride's pacing is bad when I have to watch the same video six <laughs> times just to figure out what's going on. The party bus barely shakes back and forth, not making it feel like it's going fast at all. Whenever NOS is used, all it does is blow smoke in your face and blow out your eardrums. Vin Diesel becomes 50 feet tall when he grabs onto the helicopter, and before you know it, it's over. It's one of the most embarrassing, lackluster, and boring ride experiences ever created. I mean, I thought Journey into your imagination was bad, but this takes the cake. I don't usually give my opinion on attractions we cover for the channel, but let's be honest here. This ride is a flaming bag of dog shit that Universal left at my front door, and I'm not gonna stomp it out. I'm gonna let it burn, and I don't give a shit what happens. Pardon the pun. And number five, the perception. What's most infuriating about the attraction isn't how bad it is, but how it was handled for Universal Studios Florida. I go by one rule when it comes to replacing attractions at parks. The new ride must be just as good or better than the one it's replacing. In this case, Supercharged replaced not just one, but two attractions. And while Disaster had run its course, thanks to you, Mikey, ruining the finale, what an asshole. Beetlejuice was still an entertaining show that was worth seeing. Universal built a brand new show building estimated to be over 110,000 square feet where the two attractions were, and for what? To take the same experience that was already met with mixed reactions in Hollywood, not fix any of the criticisms it received, and expect it to be just as big of a hit as Escape from Gringotts was? With so much space available, why not create a completely different type of attraction? Why not make something like Test Track, a ride where you're actually in a car, where even something like Gringotts' screen roller coaster hybrid, speeding from screen to screen with one or two launches in between? Even though it's nearby, I would have preferred something like Transformers or Spider-Man. It would have actually felt like you were in a car, spinning and moving up, down, left, and right. Even if Universal didn't want to reuse any of the previous ride systems, they could have just built a roller coaster and call it Fast and Furious. That would have worked. Any of the ideas I just pitched would have been better than the monstrosity that ended up at the park. As when it comes to Fast and Furious as its own attraction, I think about street racing or taking part in a heist in my own souped up car. Not being on a bus with 47 other people who now regret waiting 10 minutes to go on this shitty boringness. It's just frustrating that Universal thought the ride was acceptable for one of its flagship parks. When Universal decided to take three of the most popular stops from the studio tour, the King Kong Encounter, Jaws, and Earthquake, and bring them to the park when it opened in 1990, they expanded and fleshed each out to make them their own standalone attractions that are still praised today. Nothing substantial was added to Supercharged. No new scenes, no new special effects, just the removal of 3D, which was probably a good thing. Hell, even take a look at Skull Island Reign of Kong. Universal at least added three new scenes and a pretty impressive animatronic for the finale, instead of just half-assing it to only include the same scene from the studio tour. Now, I can't confirm it, but I have heard through rumors and innuendo that the blame shouldn't be put on Universal Creative for the attraction, but instead be directed towards their parent company, Comcast. Wanting to create synergy at the park for Faith of the Furious, the eighth film in the franchise, the most hated company in America wanted supercharged in the park not only as quick, but also as cheap as possible, which actually would explain why no major additions were made to the attraction. Terrible service and Comcast. Name a more iconic duo. If there is a silver lining to this story, it looks like Universal has dropped any plans to bring this dumpster fire to Universal Studios Beijing when the park is scheduled to open in 2021. At least they had enough decency to keep the suffering to a minimum. Fast and Furious Supercharged is one of, if not the biggest misstep Universal has ever made when it comes to their theme parks. A complete mess full of perplexing choices, the attraction is a prime example of everything not to do when it comes to planning and developing a theme park ride. Even though I and many others have scolded the ride for its many, many flaws, you should still at least once experience it for yourself to really see what all the criticism is about.
I mean, take a look at the bright side here. If you're ever in Florida, you'll never have to wait that long to ride this piece of shit attraction. So that is the theme park history of Fast and Furious Supercharged. All of a sudden, I feel the weight of the world off my shoulders. The attraction can't hurt me anymore. Hey Vin, you stay, I go, no following. A special shout out to all the theme park fanatics on my Patreon in the description down below. As always, thank you for watching the video and supporting the channel. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and if there's any attraction you would like us to cover in a future video, leave a comment down below. Once again, thanks for watching, and until next time, I don't have friends, I have family. Whatever the hell that means, so stupid. If there's one thing I know about Orange Cassidy, he loves the Fast and the Furious movie franchise. Oh yeah, that will make him come back. That's his favorite.